All right. Hello, all. Welcome to the GCWS Feminisms Unbound panel, Stillness and Social Movement, the Consortium for Graduate Studies in Gender, Culture, Women, and Sexuality is a collaboration between nine institutions in the Boston area. Boston College, Boston University, Brandeis, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern, Simmons, Tufts, and UMass Boston. We bring together feminist scholars and faculty from across our institutions and more through graduate level courses and a myriad of events each year. This is our second Feminisms on Down panel and we will have two additional ones planned for the spring semester. The third will be in February 2021 on global protests and the fourth will be in April 2021 on going viral. Additionally, we are planning a free virtual conference with the theme Radical Love Across Difference in April 2021. Graduate students from any discipline and university across the country are welcome to submit their work. The CFP will be open until January 10, 2021. And then next semester, we are offering three courses, Death and Feminism, Feminist Inquiry, and the third course is Women in Science and Academia, challenges and policy solutions. These courses are available to graduate students of any discipline at our member institutions and we're accepting applications until July 3rd, January 3rd, 2021. Uh, more information on these events and our upcoming courses can be found on our website and you can also learn more information about GCWS and what we're offering on Twitter and on Instagram. We welcome you tonight to engage with each other during the webinar through the chat um, and then add any questions for our panelists to the Q&A box. We're going to pose questions to our speakers after they've each had a chance to present. When applicable, please add who your question is directed towards in the Q&A box and then you'll also be able to upvote questions that other people ask. If you want to see the closed captioning, you can hit the closed caption button on the bottom of the Zoom. We're also going to share a link where you can see the transcripts as it's being created if you need to adjust the font size and color. And thank you all so much for joining. I want to thank our speakers for sharing um, and being here for tonight. And now if we want to turn our attention over to Dr. Faith Smith of Brandeis, who will moderate the panel. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Faith Smith of Brandeis University, and we're so happy to have everybody here. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks very much to Stacey Lance, whom you have just heard from, and to the Consortium for Graduate Studies in Gender, Culture, Women, and Sexuality, which convenes this series, Feminisms Unbound. And to my co-conspirators, Elora Chowdhury of UMass Boston and Kareem Kubchandani of Tufts University. We made the call for tonight's panel, Stillness and Social Movement, this summer as we followed events across the US, um, in the UK, I'm thinking of Bristol in particular. But of course, we could think of 2015, for example, and the beginning of the Roads Must Fall movement at the University of Cape Town, which subsequently spread to other South African universities, to universities in the US, and to Oxford University in the UK, where it was renewed this summer in response to UK protests of the murder of George Floyd. Taking our cue from the activists organizing our own statues and other monuments that has been at the center of movements for social justice here in the US and around the world, we invited our panel to reflect on what it means to move, to be moved and to be still and how these can become resources for feminist and anti-racist reflection and organizing. As some statues are torn down and disappear before our very eyes, some quietly deteriorate unseen and unheralded raising questions about posterity and about the extent to which movements for justice depend on visual representation. What then of the resources of opacity or abstraction? Recent protests, well, and recent um, in the summer, protests convened nightly, vibrated with energy as statues were made to move differently, countering a terrible decades long visual sovereignty. In this way, removal, also prompts reflection on the ways in which subaltern creativity has long been fueled by ingesting rather than excising the objectionable element. How do these public forms convene us, publicly or otherwise, as mourners, 
as defenders of the Republic, as newly independent, as agents of reparative justice. Statues invite reflection in multiple directions as theorizations of stillness and quiet, but also of multiple registers of waiting, hope, resignation, the pause before starting up again, theorizations of memory, commemoration, repudiation, and amnesia, aesthetic debates around accretions of color, pigmentation, and classical integrity, repatriation, and the ethics of museum collection. We're very excited to welcome and to hear from our panelists this evening. And I'm going to, um, to introduce them now in the order in which they're presenting. Professor Shaniqua Roach is assistant professor my, and my beloved colleague of African and African-American studies and women's gender and sexuality studies at Brandeis University. Her research and teaching focuses on black feminist theory, queer and sexuality studies and black popular and quotidian performance. Her peer reviewed work appears or is forthcoming in outlets such as Feminist Theory, The Black Scholar, Signs, Journal of Women in Culture and Society, The Journal of American Culture, Differences, a journal of feminist cultural studies, Feminist Formations, Antipodes, Antipode, a radical journal of geography, and Feminist Studies. She's currently at work on her book manuscript, Black Dwelling homemaking and erotic freedom, which offers an intellectual and cultural history of the ways in which black homes have been tragic sites of state invasion, as well as paradigmatic entry points for black women artists, activists and intellectuals to imagine, rehearse and enact black freedom. She sits on the editorial board of Signs, a journal of women in culture and society. Um, Harvey Young, Dean Harvey Young, D Dean of the College of Fine Arts and Professor of Theater Arts and Professor of English at Boston University. His research on the performance and experience of race has been widely published in academic journals, profiled in the New Yorker, the Wall Street Journal and the Chronicle of Higher Education. As a commentator on popular culture, he has appeared on CNN, 2020 and Good Morning America, as well as in the, within the pages of the New York Times, Boston Globe, Vanity Fair and People. He's the author and editor, author and, or editor of eight books, including Embodying Black Experience. Professor Maria Regina, uh, Regina Fermino Castillo is a transdisciplinary artist, researcher, writer and educator. Born in Guatemala and raised in Miami, she works across national and colonial borders. Her research and writing critically engage dance and performance studies, anthropology, decoloniality, ontology, and new materialisms. Fermino Castillo's current book project, tentatively titled Choreographies of Catastrophe, is a multi-sided work that investigates how bodies are sites of ontological violence, in the context of genocidal coloniality and its complex and transnational reverberations across the hemisphere. Through the work of artists in Guatemala, Mexico and the United States, the book also attends to ways that those affected by the multiplicitous catastrophes of coloniality deploy insurgent corporeal strategies, not only to survive, but also to enact otherwise bodies, worlds and lives despite ongoing necropolitical control and violence. Fermino, Fermino, Fermino Castillo is also co-editing an anthology on critical indigenous dance studies with Jacqueline Shea Murphy and Karen Recoli. Professor Tina Kant is Owen F. Walker Professor of Humanities and Modern Culture and Media at Brown University and a research associate at the Visual Identities in Art and Design Research Center at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. Kant is a black feminist theorist of visual culture and contemporary art. She's the author of three books, Other Germans, Black Germans and the Politics of Race, Gender and Memory in the Third Reich, Image Matters, archive photography and the African diaspora in Europe and listening to images. Her forthcoming book, A Black Gaze, will be published by MIT Press in 2021. Professor Suraj Yengde is one of India's leading public intellectuals and a noted scholar of caste. He is the author of the bestseller Caste Matters and co-editor of, award of the award-winning anthology, The Radical in Ambedkar. 
Suraj is cu currently a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and an inaugural postdoctoral fellow at the Initiative for Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability at Harvard University. Suraj has been nominated for India's highest literary award, Saita Academy, and is a recipient of the Dr. Ambedkar Social Justice Award and the Rohit Vemula Memorial Scholar Award. Suraj is an academic activist and a noted public intellectual in the transnational movement of Dalit rights. He's actively involved in building solidarity between Dalit, Black, Roma, Indigenous, Buraku, and refugee peoples in the fourth world project of marginalized peoples. Suraj has worked with leading international organizations in Geneva, London, and New York. Suraj is also an activist in the transnational movement of Dalit rights. He's a co-convener of the Dalit Black Lives Matter Symposium and the Dalit and Black Power Movement. He runs a monthly Abed Carr lecture series at Harvard and is an associate editor of Southern Journal of Contemporary History and former associate editor of CAST, a global journal on social exclusion published by Brandeis University Library. Suraj also holds a research associate position with the Department of African and African American Studies and is a non-resident fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. And he's a, co he's a convener of the Dalit Film Festival. In their work, these scholars have asked us to consider the paralyzing effects in daily life, in life chances of the state and nation's hierarchical social arrangement They've asked us to see how dance has been a target of violent assertion of power in America since the 16th century, as well as a site of agency and resistance. They've asked us to imagine the arrested poses of black folk held captive by the camera in photographic studios, barber shops, relief lines, and parade routes in the 19th and early 20th centuries. They've asked us to consider that in the photograph conveying the apparent success of the colonizing gaze, we might discern stasis rather than stillness, a willed equilibrium of what Kant calls opposing forces and flows. They've asked us to attend to the anticipation of premature death that motivates the assembly of a photographic archive of the self on Tumblr. To honor, quoting Roach here, to honor privacy while carefully locating black agency. To pay attention to the mobilization of quiet and the quotidian as practices of refusal. Quiet, stasis, privacy, slowness, stillness as chosen, forced or claimed, forced or claimed and transformed in the wake of being forced. These are not synonymous, yet in their adjacency, we hope that they can be productive. And now we invite our panelists to speak in the order in which you are introduced. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Faith, for that beautiful introduction to this richly curated panel. I want to start by thanking my colleagues, Faith Smith, Elora Chowdhury, and Kareem Kumchandani for the generous invitation to participate on this esteemed panel. Stacy Lentz for curating what I hope will be a seamless virtual talk. Fingers crossed and to all of you for attending. So let me share screen here. I have a cute little PowerPoint for you all. All right, so my talk today, titled Black Sex in the Quiet, is based largely on my article and differences of the same title. In the article, I make the argument that since the public sphere is built on the fungibility, by which I mean the simultaneous hypervisibility and commoditization of Black female subjects, it is a fraught and potentially treacherous space for Black sexual freedom. I argue that it is necessary for Black subjects to cultivate other spaces, specifically quiet spaces, to resist the fungibility of Black women and to create room for the experience and articulation of Black intimacies and sites of reprieve. In my article, I demonstrate the hermeneutic power of Black sex in the quiet through a close reading of neo-soul artist Erica Badu's ostensibly mundane 1996 music video, Other Side of the Game. Rather than advocate silence or publicity, neither of which is a wholly emancipatory choice, I conceptualize a reading strategy that I term Black Sex in the Quiet. 
Black sex and the quiet is not simply the opposite of publicity, neither is it silence nor unfettered privacy. Today, I ask us to take up the provocation of Black sex and the quiet as we consider the role of stillness in social movements, which is to say, efforts at social change and commemoration. Black sex and the quiet challenges the public-private binary by positing a collective thinking through of the erotic of Black sexual subjects, of Black feminine subjects. It does not underwrite to business as usual in the familiar public space defined in Kevin Quashie's words by resistance, contestation, and public expression. Black sex in the quiet isn't absolutely hidden or invisible, but it resists fungibility, and therefore it resists the fraught binary between silence and publicity, thereby advocating for something else entirely, the quiet. Black sex in the quiet functions as a reading practice, a mode of reading for Black intimacies forged in the space of the public. It offers one way of accounting for those Black intimacies that blur the boundaries between the private and the public, silence and publicity. It is a different sensibility and approach to reading Black intimacies, despite the fungibility of Black female sex and sexuality, and against the assumption of publicity as a site to Black liberation. We can use Black Sex and the Quiet to re-encounter the music and visual repertoires of Neil So women, specifically Erica Badu, who's here in the middle. Historically, these repertoires have been dismissed as too sexually conservative for a Black feminist sexual liberation project and too respectable or heterosexual for a queer studies project that frequently posits and presumes erotic transgression as a public and thus masculine endeavor. Black sex and the quiet as a reading practice illuminates fresh possibilities for theorizing and analyzing Black sexualities and erotics within and beyond Neo Soul. Frequently dubbed the queen of Neo Soul, Badu elucidates the hermeneutic power of Black sex and the quiet. Cultural studies scholars Emily Lordy, Marlo David, and Jason King have discussed how Badu has largely through her embodiment of an Afrocentric New Age goddess persona, offered new representational possibilities for Black women. Badu's reconfiguration of the Black female body as nurturing, creative, and sacred, in Jason King's words, is particularly apparent in Badu's music video, Other Side of the Gang. Now, of course, Badu is a popular singer and her work participates in commodified culture, but negotiating as with the commodity form, is an ongoing process for Black women whose condition of possibility is fungibility. Different embodied strategies may yield different outcomes, but will never fully resolve Black women's fungibility. Badu's song and video for Other Side of the Game archives the anguish of a pregnant young Black woman in a relationship with a young Black man who works in the illicit economy. Although the young woman is deeply satisfied in and with her relationship, she fears that her partner's work will eventually infringe on the safety, livelihood, and general well being of her and the baby that she and her partner are expecting. Captured with a handheld camera that dramatizes the everydayness of the scene and scenario, suggesting a documentary like quality, the video images Badu as its protagonist and her then real life partner, Andre 3000, of the hip hop duo Outcast, as the source of her angst. The video both captures their mundane creation and inhabitation of the intimate life world of their visually pro-Black living space and blurs the boundaries between Badu's so-called private and public lives by quietly documenting the performed intimacy of her life with her then fictive slash real life partner. When the song begins, Badu lays out her predicament. Now me and baby got this situation brother got this complex occupation, and it ain't that he don't have education because I was right there at his graduation. His complex occupation entails work in the illicit, illicit economy, and it provides for their sustenance and survival, yet Badu fears the consequences. The beeping of her partner's pager, a metaphoric gesture to his complex occupation, dramatizes her fears. The pager literally threatens to interrupt the flow of what appears to be a playful and well choreographed morning routine. Her partner has run a shower, 
but when the beeping pager slices the diegetic sound of the video, he runs to respond to the page instead of getting in. As he attends to his business, the diegetic sound returns and the camera re-engages a forlorn looking Badu who begins to open curtains, flooding the room with light as she insists that, quote, she ain't saying that this light don't work, but it's her and baby that he hurts because she tells him right, he thinks she's wrong, but she loves him strong, unquote. Her life with her partner is a positive one, yet she fears the potential ramifications of his work on the domestic conditions that they have apparently so carefully curated. Her acknowledgement of his education and graduation signals an awareness of the structural conditions that compel young poor black men to pursue work in the public sphere that ain't honest in spite of educational attainment. Notably, Badu neither uncritically condemns nor acquiesces to such conditions, but, but instead demonstrates that such conditions necessitate quiet, critical contemplation rather than the public debates and violent condemnation that Black work in the illicit economy typically occasions. Once he completes his call, he kisses her and joins her in the task of opening curtains, helping her to clean and print the space. Their movement, vocabulary, and amiable engagement exemplify Black sex in the quiet. Their intimacy is represented as circumspect and camouflaged, clearly present, but not sexually explicit. This moment shares a glimpse of Black intimate life that is not immediately generalizable by a viewer, remaining idiosyncratic even in its emphatic publicness. It is thus not fully available for appropriation and expropriation. In this way, it undermines the fungibility of the Black subject. In the next shot, Badu covertly alerts Andre 3000 to police presence outside of their building. He saunters to the door to collect a presumably illegal package from the police, which he then hands off to Badu. Now, Black Sex in the Quiet facilitates a nuanced read of this scene, indexing the complex relationship between state power and Badu's erotic life. On the one hand, Badu publicly embodies a critique of the state as an agent of personal responsibility politics and arbiter of Black freedom. On the other hand, the state has a direct and illegal role in, in shaping the intimate life that she hopes to maintain with her partner. On the third hand, of course, the police do not want their role to be made public here. We might understand this dilemma through what Black Studies scholar Richard Iden characterizes as the perpetual instability of Black freedom projects. Badu's performances of Black Sex and the Quiet in this music video do not necessarily transcend state, state power, but rather offer alternative ways of working in, on, and through state power, as late performance theorist Jose Esteban Munoz might put it. As a reading practice, Black Sex and the Quiet minds the potential of both silence and publicity without missing the ways in which Black subjects are, routine, are routinely subjected to what Simone Brown describes as a scrutinizing surveillance. Black Sex in the Quiet seeks not to reinscribe domesticity as the domain of cisgender women, nor dismiss gender, division, gender divisions of labor within the domestic sphere. Instead, Black Sex in the Quiet takes seriously the potential pleasures and dangers of both the public and the private. Black Sex in the Quiet thus refuses the public-private binary that underlies contemporary habits of thought within both feminist and queer studies. In this way, Black Sex in the Quiet imagines something else entirely, something that may necessitate stillness to locate in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I guess I guess I'm up next here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. All right. A couple of weeks ago, uh, I woke up remembering a, a fragment of a dream that I had. Uh, it was a black child telling me, uh, and I quote, 
when I grow up, I want to be famously dead. Uh, certainly these words relate to my ongoing research on black death evidenced in an early consideration of American lynching uh, and more recently in work in progress, theorizing blackness as the undead, uh, in which I argue that an awareness of the futurity of one's own death can lead the living to see themselves as the walking dead. However, this phrase, when I grow up to be, when I grow up, I want to be famously dead, falls somewhere between. Uh, it signals the pervasiveness of black death uh, and the idea that black celebrity or at least recognizability uh, can be the result of horrific violence. I found myself and I still find myself asking, has there ever been a time when so many dead black people have been famous, not anonymously recognizable as a collective such as the black body, but nameable, identifiable as individuals. It is an odd fact that I can name more black women, men and children who were murdered by police or white vigilantes uh, than I can name uh, black NFL quarterbacks or black elected officials or black A-list Hollywood movie stars. It should not be this way. I believe that it is helpful for us uh, as we think about stillness and social movements to consider these acts of memorialization as a form of black monumentality. The recall and remembrance uh, marks time, but also gives a presence. It carves out a space for blackness. As much as the stone and marble sculptures commissioned by the daughters of the Confederacy recorded the past, uh, these uh, emblazoned masks, t-shirts, murals capture the stillness, the powerful stand and being of black women, children, and men. I want to briefly consider today this memory, this, activa this activism, this death and its futurity in three, mo in three movements. Uh, the first is stillness, the second is skepticism, and the third relates to black women's activism. So stillness. Taking a long view on history, dead black bodies are omnipresent. They are everywhere and unavoidable. They cannot not be encountered. It was the everydayness of recognizable abuse and suffering that inspired me to write my first book. Part of the impetus for that project was the cultural criticism of the, of the late 1990s. At the time, there was a critical move to imagine a future free from the racial restrictions of the past. Critics increasingly began to point to Du Bois's 1903 assertion that the central concern of the 20th century would be the color line as a prompt to make their own racial forecast for the 21st century. Whether steeped in optimism or a neologistic spirit to create a new brand identity, perhaps to book in the new Negro with the post-Black, this trend became increasingly noticeable. As critics began to articulate a being in the world that existed either beyond or was not, or was not delimited by Blackness, I did not see this position existing in the world in which I lived. I did not see black people who had the ability to not be seen as black, even as they possessed, as we all do, complex intersecting identities. I saw folks continuing to be assaulted, racially profiled by police, subjected to hiring discrimination, unjustly imprisoned, and continually reminded of their blackness. In researching that first book, I sought to connect those experiences to trace a through line from the past to the present with the aim of revealing how such events recur and repeat across generations. In embodying Black experience, the focus was on the frequency which with, with which Black bodies were abused and how they asserted a stand, a still stand in defiance of that, of that abuse. A consideration of stillness, uh, not just in force and mobility, but voluntary, controlled, purposeful stillness, perhaps best, in, perhaps best embodied by Muhammad Ali when he chose not to take that one step to be inducted to the Vietnam War, became a frame for the book. Now, quoting myself from Embodied Black Experience, while movement or at least displacement stands at the heart of the diaspora concept, I was reluctant to endorse any efforts that sought to read it solely as pure movement. Theories that focus primarily on the process of dispersal with an attendant interest in routes, pathways, and passageways threaten to overshadow and potentially absent the bodies that are actually moving. Despite the fact that Paul Gilroy, the Black Atlantic, critiqued the theorization of, and I quote, abstract embodiments of the triangular trade, end quote, critical engagements with his book tended to treat the ship as a metaphor and its routes as abstractions without sustained and meaningful consideration of the bodies that traverse those routes on those ships. Such overlooking of black bodies threatens to absent history, from, to absent from history, the African captives who survived or perished along the, the voyage, while ironically protecting and maintaining a more contemporary identitarian category that presumes their past travels. As a result, it is possible for a person to think of the diaspora in terms of the circulation of ships, music, or food without ever considering physical bodies. 
Although the ship may serve as a useful and productive metaphor, the cargo hold on those ships uh, were filled with human bodies, occasionally densely packed, often shackled, rendered immobile even as they moved across an ocean. They reveal that stillness, like movement in the body, is an integral and defining part of the Black diaspora. It is stillness, uh, the body in a state of arrest, including death, that continues to structure an often overdetermined Black experience. It is also stillness, its, its purposeful deployment, uh, rehearsed on a, see, I think I missed this, missed this slide here, rehearsed on a lunch counter stool, immortalized on a wall, performatively incorporated within one's own body that exists as a space inside of resistance. Two, skepticism. In his play, Carlisle, uh, Thomas Bradshaw resurrects and restages the 2012 encounter between Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman. In the play, the title character, an African-American politician, a Republican, laments the deaths of black boys and men. Uh, directly addressing the theatrical audience, he remembers Trayvon Martin. With actors playing the teenager and his ass assailant, Carlisle imagines an alternative version of the Zimmerman-Martin encounter in which a gun brandishing Zimmerman still stops the boy. In response, Martin whips out a gun and shoots Zimmerman. He walks away. Immediately following the scene, and as the attending theatrical audience variably gasps, laughs, or applauds, Carlisle offers his assessment. And I quote, this is what might have happened if we had a completely armed society, end quote. He and his wife drive home the point. The reason that unarmed black men get shot all the time is because they're not armed. What is new or better yet newly returned within contemporary drama of the past decade is an inviting pessimism. Society at large has yet again normalized the abuse and killing of black folk. If Barack Obama rode uh, the wave of hope, yes, we can, to the White House in 2008, then the closing of the age of Obama marked a return to skepticism. Anti-Black racial violence and racism still exist. To write in this new millennium moment is to grapple with a feeling that is undeniably old and to register the frustration of the scenic return of barriers, even in the face of political progress and advancement. It is to account for both the joy of seeing an African-American president who revels in what I've elsewhere described as Black habitus, and the profound sorrow of hearing about the murder of yet another Black person. Uh, more pointedly, it is to consider the possibility that that person could have been murdered because there was a Black president. What does it mean uh, to think of our present moment, uh, which is more than a decade old, as a period in which white nationalism emerges yet again in response and as a negative reaction to efforts to include African-Americans in American history? As scholars, how can we think of our present moment uh, in which there are calls to write, record, project Black experiences, to chisel and sculpt Black achievement, even as projection overwashing memorialized whiteness against the strain of scholarly pessimism popularized over the past decade? How can it be that the radical possibilities of social activism are imagined today to be more transgressive under Trump than under Obama? Part three, activism. It is helpful to narrate our current moment and the building of black monuments through the lens of gender, highlighting the importance and significance of black women's activism. How might we think of stillness and social activism as a womanist imperative for the 21st century? In thinking about the activism of Stacey Abrams, for example, who following an unsuccessful uh, election chose to stay, to not move away, to remain standing in Georgia, to build a coalition that would ensure that black voices and black votes would be heard and counted. Or Elizabeth Alexander, uh, whose brief tenure at the Ford offered a glimpse at the substantive impactful changes that she would bring as the head of the Mellon Foundation, literally giving us a chance to write histories anew. Or within theater studies, the continued leadership of Dominique Morisseau, who through playwriting and through administrative service has committed to creating a place for post great migration black experiences. In these and other cases, I'm reminded of my fellow panelists, Shaniqua Roach's powerful and persuasive assertion that embodied black women's subjectivity, and I quote, cultivates, alternate, uh, cultivates alternative conditions of possibility for forms of black sociality, end quote. Along these lines and in conclusion, I believe that it is possible to think of this moment of building and rewriting as an opportunity to see the power of black women's political and social activism in opposition to the rhetoric of black male academic pessimism against the long history of efforts which seek to celebrate what Caritha Mitchell has identified as white mediocrity and in tension with conservative white feminist efforts uh, 
uh, which seek to privilege notions of racial supremacy over gender equity. Despite the uncertainties of a global pandemic and an, an, and an electoral process being pushed toward authoritarianism, there is a palpable sense of possibility emerging from the steadiness, the stillness, and the determination at the heart of these movements towards social change. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, first, Shaniqua Roach and then Harvey Young. And now we're turning to Maria Fermino Castillo. Thank you. And I am setting up my screen. All right. That, uh, Stacy, does that look correct? Yes, it looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to the conveners and organizers and to my roundtable companions for the dialogue we'll be constructing together. I greet you from the unceded territory of the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luiseño, and Serrano, located 2,700 miles away from where I was born and 2,500 miles away from where the story I'm about to share unfolds. Nanshi Kot is an Ishil grandmother and war survivor who lives in Naba, Guatemala. We became friends while working on a historical memory project with a collective of war survivors. Nanshi Kot told us about Chapatse, a tree that is in hiding in the Cuchamatanes Mountains. Chapatse had originally been planted in Naba by the first mother father. Its leaves were marked with glyphs that the wise ones could decipher, sometimes warning of calamities, epidemics, and war. Though Chapatse was a source of strength and knowledge to the Ishi, the wind carried the leaves far away, causing others to fall ill. Nanshivkot explained that illness was only a warning, though, to those who harmed the earth but the affected outsiders traced the leaves back to Naba. They futilely tried to cut Chapatse down, eventually having to burn it to the ground. Nanshi Kot speculates that Chapatse was not really destroyed. It just sent its roots down and across the earth to grow elsewhere. Far from humans, Chapatse protects itself while continuing to protect the Ishil from wars and catastrophes. This does not mean, however, that wars and catastrophes never happen. The most recent war in Guatemala ended in 1996. In 36 years, the army killed more than 200,000 persons while displacing at least a million more. This was catastrophic, but not new. For the last five centuries, the networked catastrophe that is colonial modernity has besieged the region with repercussions shaping daily life in complex ways, from genocidal wars and their violent aftermaths to extractive capitalism and climate calamities, such as hurricanes Eta and Iota, which are now, as we speak, sending torrents of rain to destroy roads, homes, and lives. This concatenation of catastrophe is chronic, even ordinary, evoking Walter Benjamin's observation that things are status quo is the catastrophe. It is not an ever present possibility, but what in each case is given. Implied here is that the real catastrophe is that none of the recurrent catastrophes escape modernity's capacity to cannibalize crisis. In other words, no catastrophe is enough to stop the status quo, allowing for something other to unfold. Benjamin's use of the word catastrophe hearkens its original meaning, derived from the Greek kata, meaning down or against, and strefo, meaning turn. Catastrophe is movement, a spiraling descent, a downward turning. In this sense, Chapatse's movements were catastrophic. By turning its roots downward, its survival overturned the expected outcome 
of those who would destroy it. Similarly, the Ishil overturned the expected outcomes of the genocidal state. Categorized as permanent subversives, the Ishil were targeted for elimination under the pretext of a US-funded counterinsurgency operation. From the late 1970s to the mid-1980s, the Guatemalan army destroyed 70 to 90% of all Ishil villages and approximately 6 to 15% of the entire population. Like Chapatse, tens of thousands survived by hiding and resisting in the mountains and jungles. Though Chapatse is still in hiding, Papshas Matom, who spent much of the war in the mountains, returned. In, tw in 2012, he had a vision to build a monument. He recruited Toil Brito, who had been conceived in the mountains during wartime and was now a sculptor and archaeologist. The monument, named Umal Ik in Ishil, this means one breath and is a day in the ritual calendar, featured a 15 foot tall representation of Chapatse in the center flanked by statues of a midwife and a calendar keeper. Though Umal Ik is a monument, these concrete figures are not mere objects, and the monument does more than commemorate. Papshas and Toil base the monument's design on archaeological objects found in Naba. In Ishil, these objects are referred to as Kamawil, a word derived from an older word, kab, kab awil, that in many Mayan languages refers to objects endowed with life. Chorti Maya literary scholar Gloria Chacon extends kabawil to theorize kabawilian strategies as maneuvers that invert the matrix of coloniality and its ordering of things. This matrix categorizes matter as inert and certain persons as inert matter. In this sense, the monument is both a kamawil, as in living object, and a kabawilian strategy that, in asserting Ishil survival, catastrophically turns down and overturns a matrix in which the Ishil were categorized as killable fixtures of the land that needed clearing for extractive capital to take hold. And here's another way that Umal Ik catastrophized coloniality through a Kabawilian move. The monument now stands in front of Nebach's first Catholic church, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, which was constructed in the mid 1600s by enslaved and branded Ishil laborers this was constructed atop an Ishil sacred site. The monument's construction by descendants of these enslaved laborers simultaneously denounces the colonial violence of the church and other institutions while reactivating a Yoshibal. In Ishil, this means a place of vital life energy. To further activate the Yoshibal, Shivaska, Nan Shivkot's daughter, Nan Shivkot, who told us the story of um, the tree Chapatse. Um, Nan Shivaska and I organized a group of Ishil women to choreograph and perform dance for Umalik's unveiling in 2013. In our choreographic experimentations, we studied Kamawil, such as the one that you see on the lower right hand side from Naba, which had been looted away to places as far as the British Museum. Looking at the photos of Kamawil, the young women mimicked the movements depicted in the polychrome objects. They imagined gestures preceding and preceding these moments, seemingly frozen in time, reincorporating the bodily traces and corporeal aesthetics left by their ancestors. They created their own ways of moving in their own space and time. As per the logic of modernity as coloniality, this was not supposed to happen. 
the forms of embodiment represented in this Kama wheel were never again to exist, especially in living Ishil bodies. As such, these acts and Ishil survival itself constitute Kamawilian and Kabawilian catastrophes that start to invert the chronically catastrophic trajectory of the last 500 years. Seven years have passed since the monument's unveiling. Ishil ceremony is now conducted there and children climb the monument. The daykeeper's fingers and Chapatze's limbs are broken and statues, the statue's pigmented surfaces have been eroded by the frequent and heavy rains. As for the dancers, like thousands of youth fleeing the violent aftermath of war, at least two have migrated to the U.S. Teresa spent, spent nine months in a child detention center in Texas before being deported. Relentless, she returned to the U.S. with her sister Juana, this time eluding the border patrol. Countless other migrant youths have had worse fates. Might the roots of Chapatze, like the repercussions of catastrophe, also extend to Teresa and Juana and the rest of the Ishil diaspora in the United States? Though no one has ever seen Chapatze, Nanshif Kot insists upon its continued existence. She told me, and I quote, the tree is not visible, but it's still there. We are also part of the tree. The serpents are part of the tree. All living beings are part of the tree. I wanted to end by asserting that the deep relationality theorized by Nan Shiv Kot does constitute the continued existence and protection of Chapatse. But I confess that the increasing ubiquity of catastrophe pushes me toward pessimism. At the same time, a Kabawilian impulse leads me to ask, with a mix of hope and its opposite, how can we support this re relationality that Nan Shifkot insists upon, this relationality that exists even if we don't see it, that persists between movements and stillness, between proximity and distance? How can it be activated to impel a deeper catastrophe that is a more transformative downward turning, one that may stop what is now a runaway catastrophic trajectory to finally allow for other ways of moving to emerge. I have no answers, but I offer this up as a provocation for our dialogue and most importantly, for our potential co-conspirations. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Maria, and now for Tina. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, my co-panelists um, for such wonderful presentations and for the organizers as well. To the organizers as well, um, thank you for organizing it. Um, uh, we were asked to speak about a work, a current of past work related to stillness and movement or social movement social movement. And so I'm just going to give some informal comments about where my thinking went um, in relationship to the prompt of what it means to move or be moved, be still, and how these become resources for feminist and anti-racist reflection organizing. Um, and here I think it's important to put back on a table a term that I've worked with for some time that Faith invoked in that wonderful introduction that she gave. And that term is stasis. Um, stasis, um, which to me um, is really one of my enduring interests, um, which is theorizing the potentiality of, of stasis as the state in between stillness and movement. I find stasis as a form of motion held in tension and suspension and an effortful practice of achieving balance or equilibrium among competing forces. And I find stasis to be a really important concept for theorizing black life and black diasporic cultures in particular, 
That's because I understand Black life as an ongoing effort to be neither in constant motion nor in absolute stillness. Black life theorized as stasis refuses both of these binary states and insists on something else. And that's important to me because to my mind, African diasporic communities have never had the luxury of either absolute stillness or in placeness or constant motion. I wanna put that another way, which is to say that it's important to me uh, to think about stasis because it allows us to understand black subjects as neither perpetually moving that is in a state of flight or itinerancy, right? We are not always fleeing something. We are not restless and constantly shifting from one place to the next. We are not fugitives. Um, and on the other hand, it allows us to think about the fact that we are also never truly settled in one place, that our home remains in flux due to the ongoing precarity of Black life in the face of ongoing white supremacy and anti-Black racism and violence. So I find stasis important because it helps us to contend with Black life as a state of fugitivity, which is not the state of being a fugitive. It's about contending with forces that push us away, as well as a fierce desire to claim a place that will never truly be ours because the terms of defining Black people has rarely been ours. And thus we've had to exist in ways that it always exceed the definition of the Black subject. So again, for me, stasis is really about thinking motion and stillness together, movement and stillness together rather than in opposition. So that's, you know, so that's really important to me and what was really motivating my response to thinking about stillness and social movement. And here I, I think I wanna pose a question and formulate a question in relationship to what served as a departure for this panel, which is the political mobilization around monuments. Right? So what does stasis offer us there? And there my question is, what if we consider monuments as profound sites of stasis? What if we consider them sites of lingering and reflection that are necessarily historically unsettled and must be open to question? Again, that puts into play a whole other set of what does it mean to monumentalize? And what does monumentalization have to necessarily, or does it necessarily have to do with permanence, with being in place all the time and not being able to question that placement or that enduring um, sense of meaning. So my work has focused always primary, not always actually, has <laughs> focused in the last you know, several, several years on photography and contemporary art which is the site where I try to get people to visualize stasis and to recognize it in, in, in visualizing it, not as stillness, but as really a form of labor that has, that has transformative potential. And I do that by focusing on the intensity of images. And I have a dog that's about to start bark barking. I'm sorry. That's all that happens to me. Um, I focus on the intensity of images and how that intensity confronts us to engage them um, and how in doing so we are forced to engage black life differently. So I had the recognition in preparing for this conversation that stasis is really a kind of unacknowledged through line in my work over the last several years. It's an exploration of stasis that I think of in three modalities. And here I'm gonna share my screen. And go from here into full center mode. Sorry. Okay. So the first modality is the modality of theorizing stasis in a genre of images that I call still moving images, which I define as images that hover between stillness and motion in a variety of ways. On the one hand, 
I conceptualize still moving images in relationship to still images like these. Um, still images that move us and animate the effective labor of their viewers. So this is an image that I've written about in the past, um, or actually a series of images. It's a Twitter feed, hashtag if they gunned me down um, from 2014, that was uh, provoked and solicited by the, the murder of Trayvon Martin. And images, um, something that Harvey actually referenced in his uh, comments, the futurity of one's own death. So what does it mean to use a still image to image your future death, to image your um, likely, if not probable death, and to actually try and intervene in that loss um, prematurely, right? And to have you have you have the last word. Um, the second kind of still moving images that I uh, theorize in relationship to stasis are moving images um, that demand our effective labor by hovering in place um, in a space between motion and stillness. And here I'm, you know, uh, these these are slides from an installation of Luke Willis Thompson's piece, Cemetery of Liveries and Uniforms, where he is using a film to capture an almost completely still image of two Black British victims of police violence. Um, Graham, who is the son of Joy Gardner, who was gagged and suffocated when she was being arrested to be uh, deported. And Brandon, who is the son of Cherry Croce, who was shot by police when they, you know, when they violently in, in, uh, made an incursion into her home. So one of the things that I'm trying to say is what does stasis do to activate us so when we're seeing a moving image where the subject doesn't move. So a second kind of still moving image. And then the second modality of stasis that I'm trying to explore is the performance of slowness as a form of stasis. And here, the, the work that I'm thinking of um, that, in, that really does embody that or enact that is Okio Pakwasili sitting on a man's head. And these are photographs of the uh, performance of it or the practice of it in 20, 2018 at the Berlin Biennial. And here, what Okwi uh, um, forces us to do, right, is that it's an interactive performance where you are solicited into a space and, and asked to move microscopically slowly, right? And it is a slow durational movement that causes us to create a sustained form of contact in relationship to one another without actually touching. So for me, again, stasis is a form of slow, slowness or can be a form of slowness where we have to endure the positioning of being both in motion, absolutely slow motion, and at the same time, not moving from a single place except durationally, right? Um, and then the third modality of stasis that I um, investigate is um, stasis as a form of frequency. And here again, I think I'm totally in dialogue with, uh, with Harvey. Um, and the example that I'm showing here is the Astor Gates amazing film from 2019, Dance of Malaga, where it's both his visualization of durational slow movement, but also the sonic frequency of it, which he creates by using a form of low, low frequency, right, that vibrates, right. Um, in his particular rendering of it, he's describing it as a low frequency of vibration that is meant to get us to feel water, which was really um, uh, critical to the, um, the community of Malaga Island, a mixed race community that was displaced by the Maine government. It was the island off the, course of, off the coast of Maine that um, escaped by way of water before they were displaced. And so his rendering of this history, a suppressed history, is really about how do we activate 
a low level sonic frequency, a frequency of water, as I call it, right, to be able to establish a relationship to a forgotten or suppressed history by invoking a certain kind of responsiveness. And these last two modalities, the modality of uh, slowness as stasis and the modality of stasis as a kind of frequency brings me back to the topic of our conversation. And that topic really is, um, what if the idea of stasis as frequency, as a vibrational frequency, might be useful for thinking about the question of stillness and social movement? So for example, if stasis is a liminal state between stillness and movement, then what that has to look like is vibration, sustaining ongoing durational movement, even if it's only the vibration at a particular level without moving from a single location. To me, there is deep value in thinking about stasis in relationship to the struggle for social justice. And I refer explicitly to a struggle um, as not only about movement, but also in relationship to quotidian practices of refusal a refusal to engage, a refusal to be silent, right? And then I think that we also have to emphasize the fact that movement, movements start with everyday individual acts of refusal, like sitting down and refusing to move, to stay in one place, or refusing to move from the sight of a black man who cannot breathe. Movements come from these kinds of quotidian acts of refusal. Um, and that I guess I want to end by saying that we need to think about stasis and sustaining durational movement in order to make change. To me, stasis is about recognizing that stillness and movement are not our only choices and they are certainly not a binary choice. Vibrating in place takes effort and labor and is a powerful site of change. To put, an, to put it another way and to just sort of wrap up, we need to think about something as tectonic in terms of its shift as an earthquake, right? But what is an earthquake? An earthquake is at its core, a powerful set of vibrations that can completely reshape our worlds. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks very much, Tino and now Siraj. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me let me share my screen. I don't know if I can share yet, but let me try. Is it is the screen shareable? I think so. Uh, and also let me thank the organizers. Thank you so much for having me, Faith, Elora, Kareem, as well as Stacy. Thank you for uh, this enriching round table. Uh, my hands are paining because I was taking notes. There's just so much of diversity and so much of different canvas we bring to this wonderful table. Uh, I'm certainly more enriched by now. I'm also grateful to my co-panelists for their excellent insights uh, and and allowing me uh, and uh, 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 even if a voyeuristic view into their research uh, today, I'm going to take you to about uh, 5,000 miles away from the where we are right now, and take you to India and tell you a story about uh, the location, sex, and sexuality, and how it uh, dovetails uh, in the India's caste system and how. It manifests itself by not revealing itself in its true form. And there might be some parlances that you could draw in your own work or, or, or the activist space that we are organizing or are in right now. Uh, so this uh, gentleman right here uh, looks sagely uh, elderly, uh, but also has uh, a, a very a divine status almost a halo on the top, uh, referring or, or gesturing uh, to, and, and, uh, to, a, to a law or a legal uh, percepts of a society, if you will, the Magna Carta 
of the times. Uh, at the back, written in Hindi, is called Rajasthan High Court. Uh, it's the high court of one of the states. Uh, and, and within the premises is a statue of this gentleman who's called Manu. Uh, he is infamous for uh, uh, encoding caste into uh, India's ethic for almost 2,100 years, which remained law of the land until colonizations uh, of various sorts, be it Islamic colonizations or be it uh, the colonizations of French, Portuguese, or uh, British uh, who visited India and, 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 <clears throat> and tried to also intervene into this for obviously their advantage. Um, this story then, of course, begins to have a conversation within the Hindu society and the location of women and the Dalit as an outsider other, the impure, the polluted, who needs a more denigration uh, so as to a reminder of a caste society to stay away from an untouchable filthy body of whom I am also part of according to the laws. So, not sure if I can. Um, these are two women uh, whom very shortly I'll talk about, but obviously they are on the statue in the uh, premise of a high court uh, defacing uh, Manu. Why would they deface Manu? Obvious reason. The re the first of all, the names Sheila Pawar and Kanta Boy are daily wage workers from a from a hometown close to me, close to my hometown back in India, and 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 they are Dalit women uh, who actually took upon themselves traveled about uh, one thousand miles uh, to a different state, uh, climbed onto a very highly security secure zone and and defaced uh, Manu. Uh, and, and some of the, uh, um, uh, his, uh, the law, which was known as Manu Spruti or the law of Manu, I, I, I reproduced some of them and I will go through uh, each of those so that we can have a critical conversation or at least thought through it. I have really, uh, of, of his 2000 odd uh, 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 acts or, or, or legal doctrines, I've reproduced only a few, but it will just give you an insight into how uh, the thought of Manu I was playing playing out. Uh, of course, the first and one of the most infamous is and uh, of the many is it's the nature of women to seduce men in this world. And for that re uh, reason, the wise for for that reason, the wise are never. I can't see the screen here because something happened. But I'm sure you can uh, read uh, on the screen as I cannot. A woman, true to the and and two fourteen are are the are the laws and sub laws, clause and sub clauses. Women true to their class character are capable of leading astray men in the world, and not even a learned and wise man both became slaves of desire. And again, this the the, the desire uh, is condemned as as a contemptible thing that one should not really propose or even live through uh, the fluidities of whatever desires one should own or should have. And, and of course, uh, the, the subversion of those desires is of course attributed to wise uh, people or wise men uh, who are very much uh, uh, ensuring or who are much thoughtful about how unwiseness, which is the lowliness, the low social classness uh, uh, plays itself out in, in this. Um, one should not marry women whose names are similar to constellations, trees, rivers, those from a low caste, mountains, birds, snakes, slaves, or those of the names inspire terror. Now what Manu essentially does is he, he puts all of these categories as of those uh, who, who, should, who derive uh, a, a sort of spite within the, in the mind of a quotidian gentry. Uh, trees, rivers, of course, have also a godly status, but somehow then just moves on to low caste uh, mountains, birds, snakes, of course, is not having a reputable name within uh, the Indian uh, myths uh, and, and epics. Same goes with birds who are not considered sacred enough uh, to carry the positive messages, but have only played selective role. And slaves at the same time uh, are, are, are juxtaposed to these categories. And, and to really break down these categories, we really understand that the epics of India civilization are are placed on the metaphors that derive from various stories that have central character protagonists that work 
uh, through their own nature and objectifications. A wise man should not marry women who do not have a brother and whose parents are not socially well known. Now, this is very important in the sense that Manu is ascribing uh, to a family where having a male uh, 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 bloodline, which is your brother, is, is, a, is, is, is guaranteeing you a certain status. And that's why even in India today, if you are a woman, your brother officiates the ceremony of your child as, 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 a, as a ritual. So if you don't have a brother, then that's of course uh, been taken by someone else, but the primacy is given to the, to the, to the, to the male or, or, or to the first right as being of the brother. And, 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 and here, uh, not socially well known are basically refers to the low caste or the untouchables because the social status is not well known and ascribed to the lowest uh, uh, contemptible status ascribed to the untouchable or in, in modern parlance, the Dalit uh, body politic. Uh, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaish, these are the dominant caste men in their folly marry low caste Shudra woman. In case the low caste woman they marry, they are responsible for the degradation of the whole family and how family as a unit uh, conceptualizes in retaining or controlling and suppressing the sexuality and desires of a woman's body politic where she is not even part of this canon. And accordingly, uh, their children adopt all the demerits of the Shudra caste. So apparently in the karmic theory, the Shudra, the lower caste woman is Shudra because of the demerits that they have committed in the past life. And that's why you really need to stay away uh, from the sin, from the shadow of this, uh, um, uh, um, of, of shadow of pain, but as well as shadow of next life's uh, uh, good deeds that you might hope to potentially get. <clears throat> a female child, young woman and old woman is not supposed to work independently even at a place of a residence. Now this, this is a very interesting, uh, 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 con uh, 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 it's as a conquest on a woman's body as, as well as her independence by really controlling her, uh, her life and her livelihood, not only through uh, 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 through her independence, where independence here simply means women leaving of the patriarchal tendencies of a social order, but really to embrace a different uh, 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 livelihood, which, which, can, which can ask you to step outside the house and stepping outside the house is considered independent. If you're independent, you are not really respectable, honorable woman. And this goes of course across castes within India. And there's also uh, a, a, a uh, another of laws of Manu, which says a woman in a childhood should be should be kept under control of a father when she is young and a husband, and when she's old, she should be looked after her son. She should not in any way given a chance to think and occupy her own space to her own imagination. And of course, one of another thing is he's who he who is appointed to cohabit with a widow shall approach her at night, be anointed with clarified butter, and silently beget one son but by no means a second one. And here what we see is rape is actually qualified, uh, but, but you can get rid of the rape as an act by just anointing yourself with a clarified butter. And what the silently begetting one's son means is that rape can be committed, but if it is a serial rape, it should not it should, women should not pursue. And of course, so here, begetting son is not a legitimate act, but it's an act when you are, when you are uh, cohabiting with a widow, it goes against the laws of nature because widows are considered to be the outcast, the untouchables of society. So if you at all have a desire uh, to exploit and abuse her, uh, you just consider uh, having rape as an option, which is said in a very modified tone. So what happens to this? 1927, Ambedkar, one of the foremost uh, untouchable or Dalit caste leaders, uh, burns this, uh, leads a ceremony to burn this text way back in 1927 uh, as a signifier that this text has no more role. Uh, ironically, Ambedkar ends up writing India's constitution, almost replacing Manu when he burns Manu 1927. In 1950s, he drafts India's constitution, taking a vast gap and, and subverting almost in a Hegelian Marxist sense by bringing up a new egalitarian uh, liberal values to the India's constitution himself, of course, being an untouchable. And now this attitude continues uh, simply because the women who uh, toppled or, or defaced Manu are actually the Dalit women, not the dominant caste feminist uh, snowflake, uh, a, a, a woman from the dominant caste who did not find it appropriate 
uh, to attack uh, the lawgiver who was actually opposing all the women folks, but they find refuge in the fact that Manu was validating caste and the dominant caste woman had the privileges of caste who prioritized the caste privileges as opposed to the, to the feminine uh, lower caste status given within the, um, within the Manu's uh, broader work. <clears throat> Fast forward today, we had a, a, a last month, a, a brutal rape of a Dalit woman and this has actually rocked, uh, uh, who, was, uh, who was not only uh, raped, gang raped, but her spine was broken and her tongue was cut, but, but eventually uh, the police continued to deny. And within that, uh, the, the people who, uh, uh, the caste people who raped uh, the entire caste community came in defense of the, of the rapist. And of course, the, the dead body of that, of that victim was burnt without, uh, cremated without her parents' approval, uh, signifying that the police as well as the state missionary can really get away with the brutalities of rape. Uh, or there were very few headlines that talked about it, uh, she being a Dalit woman. It was always mentioned about a woman. The, the identity or, or, the, or the lower caste status of a woman was really removed and she was represented as a common woman where uh, very few, of course, identified as a woman. In today's context, this becomes far more relevant because 10 Dalit women are raped every day in India. This is basically a statistics and aggregate. If it's a state statistics, we really need to think they are three times more than what is reported. And there were many questions and I would really like to plug in my sister's article who after this thought about, uh, about her location as a suppressed woman or also her location as just a woman or being a Dalit oppressed woman. And I think that's the metaphor for the feminist uh, control of our own uh, directives that we continue to revisit and question within the broader feminist and sexuality as well as trans politics of India's caste order. Thank you. Thanks very much to everyone. Um, I'm going to give you what I'd love to do is is give you a chance to um, direct questions initially at e at each other. I'm seeing. Um, pessimism, skepticism, and hope as feelings that enable or disable activism or that we consider useful or not useful as, a, as one thread going through here. Another one would be um, what counts, what registers if, if we can't see it. Maria talks about supporting a relationality you cannot see. If you can't register, um, a movement within a generation only over time if the rain has washed away its evidence if it's if it's vibrational if it's slow how how do you activate and reactivate and I was and I was wondering one thing that we could say about a pessimist is that the pessimist could be the one who moves anyway or acts anyway despite the conviction that nothing happened. So, so in, in regard to the, the last presentation, under the weight of all of that um, societal belief in people's right to be dispossessed and to be disrespected, how, how, do, we, how, how, how do people imagine themselves out of that? And how, how is that even seen or imagined? But, but in any case, I'll stop talking. So, so what I'm gonna invite the panelists to do is to is to have a conversation with each other briefly, if you like. I guess I'd love to hear more about um, Tina Camp's thoughts on commemoration specifically. So before I reread the invitation that the organizers sent, I of course labored to write a whole nother Erica Badu presentation. <laughs> and the one I landed on was Erica Badu's song, AD 2000, from her second album, where she does what I'd call a quiet commemoration of Amadou Diallo's um, death at the hands of state power, so a police killing in a vestibule. Um, I think that was 1999. So that had me thinking about immaterial forms of commemoration and the fact that Badu set out with that song explicitly um, to grieve and grieve well for Diallo rather than protest the anti-Black police state, which to her mind was pulling focus from the real work of Black grief 
that needed to happen. So mm -hmm. I offer that as fodder, but I just want to hear a bit more about commemoration because I was really compelled by your thoughts. That's a wonderful um, question. And I guess what is wonderful about your question is that you um, take up the notion of stasis sort of implicitly. Um, because if we think of commemoration as going beyond the built environment, right? If we think of commemoration as exceeding a monument, right? And, and we think about what were the moments, what, what were the people who were creating these monuments trying to do with, that, with those structures, right? Mm -hmm. They were trying to shut down history, right? They were trying to monumentalize individuals in a way that was supposed to be enduring and never change, right? But what you're talking about are in alternative forms of commemoration, which I would actually say are not necessarily about grieving, but are about mourning, right? Because mourning can be generative. Mourning is about taking that grief and doing something with it. And that it is a real, it is an active enactment of, um, of a relationship, right? A relationship and also a legacy. Um, but it is not trying to describe that relationship or that legacy into a concrete surface. Um, and so I think that it's really beautiful for you to actually to, to name that because to me, that is yet another enactment of stasis, which is, right, it is not about going somewhere, right? But it is about motion in that place where you are. Um, and to be able to actually commemorate as a form of enduring the labor durational move motion, right, without leaving that place and continuing to recognize it to me is incredibly, you know, it's incredibly illuminating. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, I guess with that example, so Erica Badu describes the work as an elegy. Um, so part mourning, part grieving, but with that, I saw the work as incredibly important in part because she refused a monument or commemoration that would nece necessitate using the built environment. And I was thinking that in terms of Catherine McKittrick, so demonic ground, so a built environment or statue that would necessarily rest on a demonic ground, which McKittrick terms or understands as geographies of domination. So in the context of Badu's performance work in the 90s and that commemoration of Diallo, you know, there was the African Burial Ground Project that I think jumped off in 1991, right? Mm -hmm. And was a standing monument probably by the time that Diallo was murdered. And that monument could not forestall the police state from taking his life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it speaks to me um, of monuments as an inherently fraught process, particularly for Black subjects. So, I don't know if folks know that Emmett Till's monument mm -hmm. had to be made bulletproof, mm -hmm. right? Because no one could forestall the white supremacist violence. Um, yeah, that was going to be enacted on that physical structure. I mean, I also think that what you're pointing out is really important because you're talking about black, black mourning and grieving processes as embodied, right? Um, the extent to which the black body is created has become fungible, right? Um, the fungibility of the black body is why we have to reclaim embodiment as a practice of commemoration, Absolutely. right? Um, and, and so I think that the point that you're making is really, is really super important, but I'm, I'm talking too much, I'm gonna mute. <laughs> Thank you. If, if, if I can hop in here, um, I think that uh, one through line, I think, you know, just, just to pick up this thread, you know, was the idea that certainly embodiment and, and the focus upon the materiality and the experiential reality of bodies uh, you know, is, is of particular importance. And I think that's important to underscore, uh, especially if you think about critical discourse uh, for a while moving away from sort of the physical materiality of bodies and toward a more abstracted ideas. So, so I think that's key. Uh, one thing that I sort of, that, that resonated with me 
was the conversation around stasis and stillness. And, and, and I think and what I found really interesting about it was that, you know, I, I tend to define stillness in much the same way that Professor Camp does define stasis. <laughs> you know? and, mm. and I was thinking about that because it's like, I, don't, I personally don't think of stillness as the end point, you know, but actually part of a continuum of movement. And, and, and what, I, what made me, what, what, I, what I thought about it was that it might actually be a disciplinary difference, right? You know, so because within performance, uh, you would say, think of the tableau vivant, where your your job is to hold the pose, to stand still, to recreate the picture, you know. But like in the effort, in the labor of standing still, that actually requires it's in the, it's in the, it's in the context of movement, right? You know. So so I was thinking about how you know, and and this isn't really an effort to sort of say is it stasis, is it stillness, but to say that there's really something important around uh, you know the labor, the durational quality of of that in between where you're not stuck, you're not, you, you, you're not static, you're not, I mean, well, so, so you're not, um, uh, 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 trying to find a word that's not using stillness or stasis or static. No, but okay, uh, I, I just wanted, I, I have always wanted to have this conversation with you. <laughs> I've always wanted to have this conversation with you because you, you, it is your work that put, that took me to stasis. And it was what you were saying in terms about the performance of stasis, that to me, I uh, performance of stillness, that to <laughs> me required stasis, right? Because the, it was, it is literally the performance, like not the term, but the performance of it that is critical. And I felt that, you know, the going beyond the, and I think you're right, going beyond performance where it's baked in, Right, so performance phase. The performance itself is baked in to its adjacent term, stillness. In my world, it's not. <laughs> right. In my world, the labor is completely erased. Um, and so that, to me, particularly in terms of photography and the black subject within photography, um, to make their labor and to actually make black people's labor visible, right, to me required stasis outside of performance studies. Right, because the enactments that they are that black black subjects are engaged in are not performances, <laughs> right? They are labor, and so that's the, that's sort of the it's a it's a distinction, but it's not a difference. That's what I, that's how I talk about it, right? Yeah, I agree with you. I don't know. I I saw, I guess, a bit more through lines um, between the work and. I guess I'm specifically thinking about Professor Camp's still and moving images and different registers of labor. So there's aesthetic labor, you know, that visual culture mandates and necessitates. And that to me, um, it strikes me as performative. So like performance, labor, et cetera, et cetera. It's just conjuring so many different registers of labor, even the effective labor, labor, Professor Camp, that you talked about. So the effective labor that so-called still images or stasis even requires or demands of the Black viewer in particular. It actually raises a question that was somewhere in the chat, in the, in the Q&A mm -hmm. um, that was directed to me, which was interesting, um, where the, the question was posed when you spoke about being it being labor, stasis being labor, um, I couldn't help but wonder whose labor is required to create this stasis. Mm -hmm. There's, does stasis continue to belabor Black bodies within, with, it, with the work, or is the labor more liberatory than I'm imagining? Mm -hmm. And I think that goes to your point, Shanifa, um, which is, uh, yes, Black bodies, Black and brown bodies, right, are belabored, right, particularly belabored. Um, but insult to injury is that that labor is often rendered invisible. Um, and so that's kind of my point. And I think that's also a through line in the work that we're all doing in Siraj's work and Maria's work as well. Um, it's what does it take to make that labor, that embodied labor, that effective labor visible? And my point is in making it visible, we have a route um, to begin to refuse that erasure and to begin to claim other forms of agency. If I could, if I could say a word um, it, in contrast to that or, or complementing that visibilization of labor, I'm intrigued by Dr. Roach's um, invocation of the um, 
I think the word you used is a. Uh, well, I can't think of it, but private or the 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 quiet, the 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 willing, the willingly um, invisible, and I'm thinking of that in relationship to um, all that I could not share about the monument project and the ceremonial um, activations that accompanied the monument project and the dance project. Um, I'm thinking of um, things that. Black and brown peoples um, protect from view and protect from the, mm -hmm. the fungible expropriation and extractivism, and and that through the um, through the willful um, willful veiling or um, hiding, as as um, you know, Chapatse, the tree hiding in the mountains, um, there is a source of power. There's a source of inviolability. So, um, listening to, to 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 the conversation, I'm thinking of 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 those. Um, they're not binaries, but perhaps they're very fertile um, elements that exist in a relationship and used strategically to enact different um, revolutionary, if you will, objectives. And I'm thinking also just um, of Tina Camp's. Um, um, mention of the tectonic, of the underground, of the underneath. In my work, I refer to it as the telluric. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really excited about being in conversation about these, um, yeah, these rumblings beneath the surface of things and the kind of activations they make possible. Mm. I can respond. Um, yeah, thank you so much. So, you know, I'm seeing Black sex in the quiet, um, to use Professor Camp's generative language, as a quotidian form of resistance, um, an everyday act of survival in the face of an anti-Black police state and an anti-Black police state that has transhistorically um, rendered the labor of Black home building quite moot whether we're talking about home building in the context of the plantation, like the slave quarters, um, or even Breonna Taylor's home, you know, which was not protected from, you know, anti-Black state invasion. So I think Black dwelling sites are geographies that remain under state sanctioned siege. And in that way, Black women's reclamation and cultivation of a Black dwelling space um, can't be overlooked or invisibilized um, as a superficial project, as an apolitical project, um, as a project that doesn't necessitate a strategic balance of cultivating some modicum of privacy and shielding oneself from public scrutiny and surveillance. There's a, okay, there's a question in the chat Mm -hmm. um, that's directed to um, Professor Camp and Professor Young, but but I wondered if um, Maria, it, it, I see it connected to Maria's presentation as well. I, I wonder if they'd like to speak about preparation, that in refusing to move, but but be moved, whether or not moving away from a black body being murdered or staying in place, there is labor in the present, but also the past. What prepares us for remembery? for our heirs to hear the ghost, to create the quiet around for it to happen. Um, the question is directed specifically to, to the experience of Black diasporic peoples. Um, so I'll defer to um, Dr. Campton, Dr. Okay. Rick, and then I, I can say a, a word about that. Okay. I, don't think it, I don't think it is specific to us. It is addressed to us, but I don't think it is specific to the Black body. Um, and, and it is a vexing question to me um, to think about preparation, mm -hmm. because to think about preparation uh, has a temporality mm -hmm. to it that assumes that um, there is a possibility of preparation, right? Um, but I think that the temporality of Black life is about anticipating negation, right? <laughs> anticipating um, 
what does it mean to be rendered fungible, right? Um, and so I don't know if that counts as preparation. I know that counts as an expectation that needs to be acted upon. I mean, in that particular mode, I just go back to, you know, I go back to George Jackson and Lines of Flight and, you know, Deleuze. Um, so what does it mean not necessarily be to be prepared, but to be willing to pull a gun, <laughs> right? <laughs> to be willing to die um, because, you know, what are the options? The options are to fight. And I don't know if it's a preparation to fight, <laughs> but it's a willingness, it's a willingness. Um, so I guess I get confused about the temporality of preparation um, and how that is sort of, what is the longer history of that preparation? Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so, but I'm, I'm literally, I'm riffing, so I, I, <laughs> help I'm me out. In there, I guess, you know, with Black women and homemaking, I think about Angela Davis and mm -hmm. her thinking about the slave quarters as a site of preparation for mm -hmm. Black resistance. So I think, you know, we do have sites of preparation, temporalities of preparation. I'm thinking even about ancestral preparation to, to invoke another black feminist musician, Janae Iko has a song where she says like, baby, I was born tired, right? So like this preparation feels maybe psychically ingrained and we huh. don't necessarily have access to. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, uh, if, if I can hop in here, just, just a couple of thoughts and this is riffing, this is to, to say, just, just riffing here, <laughs> you know? Uh, I think one part of it is, if you think about it in terms of uh, the frequency of these of these murders, right, um, and 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 they're coming at at, at such a pace uh, that it's overwhelming, you know. So if you think about it in terms of like you know you know in terms of funeral practices and, and the rituals of 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 the wake and the laying out of the body and the choosing of of, of, of the, the seeing of the body, um, you know, the choosing of, 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 of how to be costumed and clothed mm -hmm. uh, as a way of sort of working through that sense of absence, right? You know, working through the, 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 you know, the, the death, the stillness of the body. Um, you know, the, 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 this, these deaths come again and again with such great frequency, you know, that we don't actually have the process to um, um, begin to heal before there's another disruption, right. before there's another wound, you know, that right. comes along. Um, and so, you know, so, you know, so I, and, I, and I was thinking about this relative to social activism on college campuses, right? Um, and, and, you know, and I, uh, you know, was thinking about sort of college undergraduates who, you know, were, you know, were, 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 were preteens, you know, when Trayvon Martin was killed, they were mm -hmm. the same age as Tamir Rice when he was killed in the, mm -hmm. on the playground. You know, and just the fact that, like, for the last decade of their lives, mm -hmm. it's like these highly visible um, uh, mm -hmm. murders, you know, were occurring. Um, and 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 how do you get prepared for that, right? And and that's where I've been thinking about this sense of the of the undead. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think that's that's the hard part for this is 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 can one, um, you know. Um, you know, like I mean, and, and, and you know, like how does one deal with this? And then the the last thing I'll say, and, and this for for a riffing part, if you think about speaking of Tamir Rice, um, Tamir Rice's mother, right, expressing concern around the commodification of of Tamir Rice, right? You know, and what does it mean to have uh, this? You know, you know, the the person you loved um, and you buried, uh, you know, then sort of becoming something else entirely, right? So how do we account for the, you know, the recirculation of these images? How do we account for the remapping, the projection of, of, of people's faces detached from their full life, uh, as we saw with Trayvon Martin? Um, and how does that itself create an issue relative to the preparation uh, to handle the absence of the wound of the murder? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I want to say quickly to leave time for other questions, um, just that um, preparation for the rememory, um, such a poignant question. And um, in the case of um, the Yishil genocide, uh, there were decades of silence around 
there, there was a, a, a period of, of just 30 years of silence around the genocide because um, survivors of the war did not want to re-traumatize um, their children and their grandchildren. They didn't want to re-traumatize themselves. Um, what happened in um, Guatemala in 2012 was um, a genocide trial against the architect of um, the genocide. So, um, you know, people, the people who experienced this this violence um, made a decision to bring it to the courts to enact justice. Um, other things were contingent to that decision too. Um, an epidemic of youth suicide in the Ishil region. Um, also, the um, Forensic Anthropologists Association of Guatemala. Um, there was kind of a tipping point of, of excavating mass graves and people having funerals for their family members 30 years after being massacred. Um, and I think that this just created a, 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 a need to address what had happened and to finally um, speak about it and to remember re it. Um, how did people prepare? There were many things um, that I couldn't really do justice to in my presentation, but even even the the um, the the monument had um, you know throughout its process asking for permission in ceremony, um, asking permission of the land and the ancestors, um, making sure that this was the right thing through um, these practices that really um, I'm not I'm not uh, authorized to 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 describe um, in great detail. Um, very private practices that people engaged in. Um, so I think that this is, yeah, again, um, really important to, to underscore that these kind of um, facing death, right? Like, like Dr. Um, Young um, speaks about just peoples who are targeted for constant um, elimination. Mm -hmm. Um, have to live with the specter of death all the time and then have to make decisions um, that, that are dif difficult, it, uh, unthinkable for those of us who don't have to think about that. And in my case, I just want to be very clear. I grew up in, in the United States. I am of the you know mestizo minority in Guatemala, so I, I don't have to think about these things all the time. But I've chosen to be in relationship with people who do. And to be well committed to representing their stories as well as I can. Um, yeah, so so it's a really good question that I'll I'll continue thinking about. So thank you to um, Vikramaditya Sahai for that question. And M Maria, there are two the two lo the, the the lowest um, questions in the question and answer also directed at at your presentation. Uh, the, the, for example, the last one says, thank you for sharing the story of Ishil relations to land. I keep thinking about the opening quotation that the tree wasn't destroyed, but its roots spread elsewhere. Another kind of obscurity to protect um, from beneath. Um, and and the, ask, the question is asking about the work of protection and maybe the connection between yours and um, Harvey Young's paper. Could you say more about how indigenous models of protection show up in your work that eschew militarized understandings of defense, of being armed? Thank you. And, and forgive me for taking up so much space because I, I would really love to hear from Shiraj and others. Yes. Uh, but very quickly, I, I just want to say that um, uh, Ishil indigenous models of protection don't necessarily eschew the armed forms of protection. We're talking mm -hmm. about um, a, a place in Guatemala that was um, categorized as subversive, as enemies of the state by Guatemala, but also by the United States that, you know, the U.S. funded this, this um, genocide. Um, now, there were and I'm and I'm contesting here the work of white anthropologists such as um, David Stoll, who say that the Ishil were duped into Marxism. No, I know Ishil Maya Marxists. They decided 
to take on this ideology and they decided to take up arms. Um, and that is not a bad thing. That doesn't make them killable, I, I argue very strongly. Um, and I think that this is a very um, poignant and, and timely thing to talk about because there are uh, right now in the United States, socialist and communist identified uh, identifying and identified by others, peoples who are being targeted for death. Um, so <laughs> something to look out for and to look at through the long history of US imperialism. So the Ishil did take up arms. They were part of the Ejército Guerrillero de los Pobres, the, the, um, the, the guerrilla army of the poor, but not every Ishil person. Um, so, so I just want to make that clear. I, I didn't have time to talk about the intricacies of that history. Um, but yes, the Yishil took up arms, and that's because all other ways of contesting the state through electoral means, through you know community activism and organizing, um, were met with violence anyway. So when you ex and this is, you know, common to the history of the U.S. as well. When you when you remove all options, all legal options, then people have no choice but to take up arms. And perhaps Suraj can also speak to this in the case of Dalits and other mm -hmm. communities in India that are similarly um, violently um, um, oppressed. Um, so yeah, uh, at the same time, very quickly, there are other modes of protection. Um, that are equals, equally kind of subterranean and 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 clandestine, and those are the um, spiritual or ritual modes of protection um, that that I've already alluded to. Um, I hope that that gives some nuance to the the question. Thank yes. you. I guess I'm the only one who's remained to comment, <laughs> so I just I'll just pick up from. Uh, Maria's point and also the I mean I was just uh, lost in the thoughts because there's so so rich conversation around this and you know I think uh, one of the one of the modalities of violence is what do you what do you put it in comparison with right uh, especially and also the idea of you know the dichotomy that we work with the two-ness the black and whiteness which really diffuses other uh, pragmatic possibilities of you know collaboration and, and creation but also that could then itself be rebellious in its in its instinct. And I think that's why historically violence has always uh, been not put with non-violence or not existence of harshness or not of violence. Violence is simply being construed in a very colonial framework of, 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 of refusing an agency to be angry. And, and, and of course, Fanon is an advocate of anger especially when it comes to colonization. And, and I kind of derive that inspiration, especially, you know, but also uh, how do you pr be pragmatic and impose violence upon the violent other? Uh, you know, is the American style of gun touting response an adequate response? Uh, has it stopped more black and brown bodies to, on, to be slayed on the streets? Or is it something something else? And I think I've been wrestling with this question and the state, especially as a, as a macro metaphor, invisibilizes uh, the, a, the cries, but as well as the armed conflicts that takes place on every day. I mean, you know, the civil war statistics are not always against the state. Civil war also takes place within the communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that designation doesn't get recognized because, uh, because it really needs an approval and sanction of the ruling class but also uh, the media and the technocracy that kind of uh, wants to control and manipulate uh, how civil war needs to be framed and, 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 and you know, argued for. Right? In, in Dalit context, you know, we are actually, I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion, especially, for example, borrowing from Malcolm X in this case uh, is, and also I think he, you know, and I was thinking about this, people called him militant. I think he was just natural. He was just reacting, uh, any human being would react to uh, which is, you know, uh, which is a reflex, you know, uh, and, and, and to kind of really, uh, you know, bringing the hyper uh, spiritual values uh, to, to say that, you know, you cannot really tame uh, um, a devil that is really attacking you is, is really, is really coming at the cost of uh, uh, lives and beautiful, precious, innocent lives that we, and, and you know, the, the unfortunate thing is, we continue to theorize the death 
very much taken from Dr. Young's proposal of the undead, you know, how, 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 do, we, how do we really metamorphosize the dead, which is to what is the next stage of the death? It's, is it the spectacle? Is it the, is it the hashtag enjoyized activism mm -hmm. where, where the New York or big city based corporations want to fund your black lives work or your artistic work, or is it something to really kind of cut uh, from the bottom, the foundation of this, and I think this is where this is where this could be an act of a passive uh, submission to the higher authority. And higher authority, in this case, is you know people can interpret as a religious canon, but also in my kind of framing, higher 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 authority here is your high handedness, your 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 supremeness, your own enlightenment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think there are various ways we can you know reframe this as violence of the metamorphosizing of death. Thank you. This looks like Maria's question in the chat. Um, sorry. I'm sorry, I think some people are signed in somehow with my link, but that's okay. not me, it's someone Good. else. Okay. It's about the power of the in the, the power of the invisible and the technology of visibility that is wrought with whiteness making or um, caste making and the labor to empower and utilize the knowledge that um, is enlivened in the invisible. This is addressed to all the panelists. My good. Can I just can I just add to Suraj's comment about cutting from the foundation? I I I'm looking for language uh, around uh, this this like yeah as Suraj said like the 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 the, the parameters of of armed conflict of of resistance are already so ready made. Mm -hmm. by, by the state, by coloniality, by white supremacy, mm -hmm. <laughs> that that I'm I'm interested in 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 things that look that like that go to the tectonic and 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 work there that cut from the foundation. And Suraj, um, you know, you, you talked about I guess the the, the transcendence or mm -hmm. yes, um, so yeah, and that's that's where I'm using terms like catastrophe and like deconstructing and reconstructing for my own purposes the term catastrophe because i think that that's like that's where we are where where how do we how do we stop this runaway trajectory right so you know the person who signed in under me and talked about the visibility wrought with whiteness it's or uh, yes, the invisible and the technology of visibility wrought with whiteness. Like, how do we escape whiteness and whiteness? You know, kind of a stand-in for all these structures of domination. How do we? How do we break and move into another ontology of resistance? I don't know. I'm I'm looking at this question connected to Suraj's question, yeah. and I I'd love to hear some wisdom around that because it's like it's urgent. Yes. <laughs> Yes, Suraj also talked about an end point of liberation, which gets tied back again into the NGOization. And so how, how does one escape that? Uh, that was really, that was really powerful. It's 827. And so I, I guess what I would want to do is invite um, panelists uh, it's 827 as I'm speaking, it will become 828. So I guess I want to invite the panelists if, if they feel so moved to, to, to say a final word. I guess we should follow the order. <laughs> if, you, if you like, you don't have to. I don't, I don't have a final word. <laughs> I, I will leave the final word to others, um, but I have, I feel like there's so much that has been said and I'm right now I'm chewing and, and turning in my head. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll hop in here uh, and, and just in, in terms of thinking really from a US context, but it, it impacts uh, sort of global relations. 
uh, if you think about sort of monumentality uh, and and this moment we're in re related to the U.S. election uh, and and the refusal to see um, uh, you know sort of uh, non-white people of color wanting change and with refusing to acknowledge that, you know, I think that that really gives us a sense of the labor uh, that is required uh, in support of activism because uh, whiteness does not have any issues with sort of starting to make, you know, in, in terms of trying to maintain power, right, and authoritarianism. So, so how do we move forward, um, you know, in this current moment? I guess my final thoughts um, are deceptively simple, but incredibly challenging. And this is to the comment about the power of the invisible and the technology of visibility, that is wrought with whiteness making or empower, caste making and the labor to empower and utilize the rich, the knowledge enlivened in the, invis in the invisible. So I'd say two things and I'm quoting from other black feminists here. Black women constitute the belly of the world. It's idea Hartman. So trust black women, Brittany Cooper, about what they have to say about their own experiences. Trust black women's homes as sub production about the world, about anti-Black regimes and possibilities for resistance. Thank you. I guess I'll just offer my departing thought uh, on, on something of this kind of eco sphere we have created. I think the arbitrariness of white as a category and whiteness as a, as a vocabulary uh, to maintain uh, uh, its its absolute control and power, it's, it's quite uh, you know I, I'm writing about especially going to the historical archives of 16th century Iberia, also looking Hitler right when Hitler conquests Slavic people, they, they are still inferior race. Uh, when they come to America, the Slavics become white. The uh, the uh, stupidity of American racial regime, or rather, uh, it's it's almost, almost comical that really predicates on on harming black as a category uh, in, in defiance of all other scientific uh, uh, gestures that uh, that 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 innovate people to think beyond this and i think uh, what then again whiteness as a you know can white remain uh, a subject of contestation at the same time become a victim of its own contestations and i think that humanistic approach uh, really invites us to think through the capitalist as well as fascist modes of white making that kind of you know destabilizes the working class solidarity in, in, in larger in a larger sense. Yes, of course Du Bois argues in black reconstruction that even it's a black labor, <laughs> still the system is benefiting the, uh, the, the, the the white labor as opposed to the black labor. And I and, think and we, we really uh, meet at a point of capitalist enterprise as well as racial slave economy that kind of marries into producing what we have I think today's vicious white supremacist regime. Thank you very much. I want to thank the panelists so much for your urgency and your imagination. And I want to thank all everybody who attended for, um, for being here and for um, activating the space. Um, good night to everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.